Good evening, everyone. I'm thankful to be uh, here at this Faith and Science Conference. Uh, I think back to my years of uh, attending these Faith and Science Conferences and uh, Leonard Brand and others of the Geoscience Institute used to invite me uh, quite often to go on their field trips and I'm glad I'm, I, I decided to stay for another day so I'd get one on, on Thursday, Thursday afternoon. So I'm glad to be here. Um, some people ask me how old I am and my stock answer is I was born a few years after Noah's flood. <laughs> That's all you're going to get out of me. My first time to come to Australia was the weekend after 9-11, when the Twin Towers fell. The only good thing that happened about the Twin Towers falling before I came was that when I went to Avondale College and ate with all of the professors there, they told me, we usually roast those who are from America with anti-American jokes. But in honor of what happened to you, we're going to introduce you to Aussie roasting of Kiwis and Kiwis roasting of Aussies. And so I had a delightful hour of listening to the most wonderful banterings back and forth between those two um, factions of the faculty. Uh, I got up to speak the first time, realizing how little I knew about this country. I talked about the Aussies rather than the Aussies and made a lot of faux pas like that. So anyway, I'll probably make some more before this evening is up. I'd like to just share for a minute or two about my personal journey of biblical authority and the flood. When I went to college, great college, all it takes is one, one teacher to plant a few doubts in one's mind. And that happened to me. Those doubts, as I was raised in the age of the hippies back in the 60s, ripened into a desire to always question everything. And so as a young pastor, I imbibed the latest trends of the historical critical method and used my reason, without realizing it, to test what was true in this word of God. It was not until I came to a Bible conference very similar to this that I heard the speaker take us back to creation and talk about what happened to Eve as she heard the lisping of the serpent and the, the word sounded so nice. It appealed to her empirical evidence, to her reason, to her aesthetics. And so she listened to the words of the snake rather than the word of God. And that night, the Holy Spirit penetrated my thick mind. And I realized that I, like Eve, had been eating the forbidden fruit rather than trusting in the Word of God. And that night, my life changed around, and I determined to give my life to upholding the authority and power of this book. My dissertation was my first introduction to the flood, because one of the passages I had to study when I was studying typology was the study of flood typology in 1 Peter chapter 3. And so I began to wrestle with the flood in connection with bigger issues than whether it was universal or, or local, but issues that the flood was pointing towards salvation, that it was a salvation event that took place and became the foundation for Peter to write about Jesus saving us through water of baptism, like the people went through the water and the flood. And Jesus was the ark of our salvation. So I got excited about the flood. So it was, it was exciting for me when uh, the Geoscience Research Institute 
As a young scholar, I was asked to write an article on the, the subject, on the universality of the flood. That was 1995. And I've been interested in this topic ever since. I come back and revisit it every once in a while and I find new arguments, I find new evidence, I find new things to cause me to wonder and to rejoice in this story of the flood. And so in the four sessions that I will have with you, I want to share with you tonight evidence that has convinced me beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Bible teaches a global universal flood, not a local flood. And uh, tomorrow morning we want to look at the theology, the richness that comes out of this flood story that's relevant to our life. The practical lessons that come from an, a, a, a close reading of the story of the flood. And then in our two sessions, we'll get into some more technical issues and some questions like, what about the dinosaurs? What does the Bible have to say about that? And all kinds of fun stuff in the, in the two sessions. So that's sort of an overview. So uh, I am convinced that the question of the extent of the flood is not just an, a case of idle curiosity with little at stake for the Christian faith. We've already heard that in our introductory presentations. Uh, it is clear from scripture that the, the worldwide flood is inextricably linked with a literal creation week. And as, I, and I've, as I've been doing study on the Genesis account of creation, I've come to the conclusion that if you're going to go with a literal six day creation recently, How are you going to explain the geological column? And the only way that Genesis 1 and 2 as a literal creation account can make sense is, this, is, if, is if you have a, a literal global worldwide flood that explains at least part of the geological column. Um, we've got a lot of people out there that have accepted the conventional geological column representing millions of years and the, the thing they have to do to accept that is they have to conclude that animal death and the sin of Adam have no causal connection uh, which, which contradicts the clear biblical claim that the wages of sin is death and furthermore it undermines the atoning sin forgiving power of Jesus' death. So what we decide about creation is intricately linked with the flood, which is intricately linked with salvation. And it all goes together in this one package. I believe that the traditional view, which has been held by um, the, the biblical writers and interpreters down through the ages is the one that is is the only one that's able to explain all the data in scripture we have the alternative there are some who are upholding a high view of scripture but claim that when you really look closely at genesis 6 to 9 it sounds like universal language but it's actually just talking about a local flood Maybe in Mesopotamia, maybe that Black Sea flood that was a colossal event. And so the writers are simply using language to, uh, rhetorical language to describe uh, a local flood. Uh, what are the main arguments? The main argument is a scientific one. I'm reading a book, I just finished a book by John Walton and uh, a Tremper Longman III who have written this book The Lost World of the Flood and repeatedly Leonard Brand repeatedly they say there is absolutely no geological evidence for a universal flood categorically and they try to discount the arguments I wish they were here to hear Leonard Brand and some of the other presentations unfortunately they're not uh, they also seek to go to the biblical text 
And they look at words like, like the word for world, Eretz in Hebrew. And it's true. Sometimes this word can mean the whole world, the whole globe, or there are times it can simply mean the land, like Eretz Israel. I just got back two weeks ago from a tour, three-week tour in Israel and Jordan and, and Egypt. My daughter and I, for the first time, she's an Old Testament teacher too, and we were able to lead this tour together. It was an awesome experience. We got to walk from the north to the south of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. It's the same word that's used in the flood. So how do we know whether it's local or whether it's universal? Context is everything. When I add the word Israel to Eretz, you know it's talking about an, a local place. So we have to look at the context of Genesis 6 to 9. I've already stated this. I believe only the traditional understanding of Genesis 6 to 9 as depicting a global flood does full justice to the biblical data. We don't have time tonight for all the different arguments. Uh, there are many uh, lines of biblical evidence uh, that uh, point in this direction. But I just want to show you some of the ones that are, to me, the most, uh, the most punchy. Okay? So let's start with uh, practical evidence, theological evidence, practical evidence, then we'll get down to the nitty-gritty of the terms. When you start in Genesis 1, you have a picture of a universal creation. God creates the heavens and the earth, and the earth is out form, and God starts forming it and filling it. And then the Sabbath, it's, it's a universal creation. And then when there's the fall, the fall is a universal fall. And, and then you come to... God's plan for salvation in Genesis 3.15 where he promises to send the messianic seed to redeem not just a few people in some part of the earth but to redeem the whole world. It's a universal theme. And then you come to the flood. If the flood is only a local flood, it's the only local piece in the whole, in the whole sweep of these opening chapters of Genesis. It doesn't make any sense if it, everything else is universal and then the, and then the flood is only uh, local. Uh, just, I've already given some examples. Human sin is pervasive, encompassing all humans, just not in the local area. And especially in Genesis 6, I love this text. In Genesis 6, verse 6, it says, God regretted that he made... Who, what did he regret that he made? Mankind. Not just that he regretted that he made a few people in Mesopotamia. He regrets the creation of humanity that has gone astray by and large. And so he says, I am going to bring an end to Adam, to humanity. Except for, and the next verse says, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And so he saves that remnant. But it's a universal theme of God's creation and tomorrow morning we're going to see, uh, sorry, it's tomorrow afternoon we're going to see how it's creation and then uncreation and then recreation. It is this rhythm that includes the first 11 chapters. How about the genealogies? These uh, some people shy away from reading the genealogies, those boring lists of begats no, don't ever, don't over, don't ever slough over the genealogies as unimportant because they show us the moorings of the flood within history. They show the genealogical movement from Adam down to Noah and then from Noah to Abraham. And it starts with Adam, that single human and then Eve, who is formed out of his side. And then the fall comes and humanity falls. And we know the story of the two ways of the seed of Cain and the seed of Seth. And then comes the flood. And humanity is destroyed except for one, one family, Noah and his family. And then the story starts over again. And there's one person, 
exclusively this one person, Noah, with his line that then the world spreads out into all that we have today. So these exclusive genealogies clearly imply that all humanity on the globe outside the ark perished after the flood, except for Noah and his family inside the ark. Uh, in Genesis 1, you hear the phrase, God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And after the, the flood, as Noah steps out of the ark with his family, what does God say again? Noah, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The same language of Genesis 1. Noah is, in a sense, is the new Adam. He's the, the new Adam that is starting the world over again with a new start, repopulating the world as in the first Adam. So you got this same inclusive blessing upon Adam, which then is a universal blessing. And then when it's funneled down to one person and one family again, here's this blessing again. That's an exclusive blessing. It wouldn't, that doesn't work if it's just a few people in some local area and doesn't include the whole world. This is one of my favorite ones. The God's covenant and his rainbow sign. First of all, the rainbow doesn't just hover over Mesopotamia or the Black Sea. You see the rainbow throughout the world. We're going to see some special things tomorrow about the rainbow that maybe you haven't thought of. I call it the rainbow connection. We'll look at that tomorrow. Uh, but if God puts the rainbow as a sign of his covenant, which he makes, it says, with all living creatures, that's what Genesis 9 tells us. If there was only a local flood, then the covenant would be only a limited covenant. If he's just talking to the few people in Mesopotamia or the Black Sea, then his covenant, which... Isaiah picks up and uses a type of the new covenant of grace would be only a limited one. And as you move to the related theme, the universal divine promise, think of this. God promised, Genesis 9, 15, I will not send a flood to destroy the earth ever again. Think of the implications if it's only a local flood. The implication is every time we have a local flood, God is breaking his promise. You get that connection? You see that reasoning? If it's only a local flood, then God isn't keeping his promise. He, sends, he, do, he allows lots of local floods to come. How about the necessity of the ark? This is one of the most obvious ones. If it really was a local flood, why would you need the two by two to go together to preserve the seed? Just go over the next mountain. And especially the birds. They could fly out of the Mesopotamian Valley with very little trouble, but no, they're part of what is destroyed in the flood. Why didn't they just go to another area if it was only a local flood? Then the waters covering all the mountains. That could not involve a local flood because you all, it doesn't take a scientist to know that water seeks its own level across the surface of the globe. If it covers the mountains of the local area, that means it's going to go everywhere else too, beyond the local area. So these are logical Theological issues. Another one is the duration of the flood. Over a year of water falling and then rising and then coming down. Any local flood that does that doesn't seem to make sense with a local flood. And then we have the New Testament references. I won't spend much time on this because there's going to be a whole paper on these New Testament references. But the New Testament passages use this universal language. Matthew 24, they swept them all away. Luke 17, destroyed them all. 
2 Peter 2, he did not spare the ancient world when he brought a flood upon the world of iniquity. Universal language. The New Testament typology, where the flood is used as a type of baptism and then especially as a type of global judgment. Peter depends on the fact that the flood is global in order to make his argument that the final judgment is going to be global. That's his argument. Just as God destroyed the ancient world globally, so he will destroy the world again, not by water, but by fire. It doesn't work if it's only local typology. All right, the time that we have left, we got some time left, good. Let's look at some terminology. Uh, I think the most, imp- most Im- the most important biblical evidence is all of this inclusive terminology found within Genesis. Just open up Genesis 6 to 9 sometime and just read, read the things that could not be taken any other way than universal. I've counted 28 such expressions. I'm not going to labor you with all of those, but some of the most crucial ones that indicate the global global scope. Here we go. Uh, Now, I have to, I would feel very bad if I went back to Andrews University and I hadn't taught you at least one Hebrew word. Okay? I could not face my students and tell them I went and I didn't teach you a Hebrew word. So in our classes at Andrews, when they take issues and origins, Everyone has to learn this word. And it becomes a favorite. You can tell those students who have had issues and origins because they go around sometimes shouting to one another, Mabul! Mabul! Come on, let me hear you say it. Mabul! See, you know, amen. You know, hallelujah. You know all these Hebrew words. Why not just add one more? Mabul! One more time, come on. Mabul! Okay, take it home and shout it to your friends as, and, uh, and then tell them why so they don't think you're crazy. Anyway, so. <laughs> Twelve times this word mabul occurs in Genesis. And only one more time outside of Genesis, that's in Psalm 29 when it's talking again about the global flood. This word is the word the special word for a global flood. It's never used for local floods. It's only used for the Genesis flood. Thus it sets, it, sets the Genesis, the Noahic flood apart from all the other floods. So mabul, crucial. Other terms, all existence. The Hebrew word haikum. Uh, it literally means existence. And it refers to the totality of life on the earth. So uh, the new uh, the new uh, NJPS, uh, Jewish Publication Society translation of Genesis 7, 4, I will blot out from the earth all existence that I created. And then in verse 23, he says he's, he's done it. All existence on earth was blotted out. Man, cattle, creeping things, birds of the sky, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark crucial universal term on all the dry land this word uh, the word land is not literally there it just means and all the dry it's the same word that is found in Genesis 1 where God lets the dry appear and here's the dry in the flood Uh, under the whole heaven this is used several times in the Bible and it always refers to a universal, the whole, the whole sky, not just some local spot. Exodus 17, Deuteronomy 4. But the most important ones are ones that specifically link Genesis 6 to 9 with Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2 is clearly a universal creation of God creating the, the heavens and the earth and forming and filling the world. And so if the flood is using those same terms over and over again, it's describing basically an uncreation. 
We'll go see, see how that works uh, tomorrow. But let's look at the terms here tonight. Uh, I, we already used the word the earth, like Eretz Israel, it can mean the land or the earth. But if there's no limiting descriptor, no word like Israel after it, when you just have Haaretz, the earth, like God created the heavens and Haaretz, the earth, it's the whole thing. It's not just some place. So it's a term that harks back to that expression in Genesis 1. Uh, the face of all the earth. Again, another global expression that harks back to Genesis 1.29. I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth. Again, a, a global expression of God's global creation. And now it's the uncreation. The face of the ground. In parallel with the face of the earth in, in uh, chapter 8 verse 9. It links it with Genesis 2.6. A mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. A universal term. And now it's used for the decreation in the time of the flood. All flesh, 13 times in Genesis 6 and 9. Sometimes uh, accompanied by additional phrases that, that link you back with creation. So for example, uh, all flesh in which is the breath of life in Genesis 6. And all flesh, all in whose nostrils the breath of life existed. Again, allusions back to creation. Just as creation was universal, so the flood is universal. Every living thing, all living things that I have made. God is not just talking about a local place. He's speaking about creation. All those things that I made on the earth. Now they're reverting back to actually a time when it was before creation. We started and it was just the globe covered with water. Just like Genesis 1, verse 2. All the foundations, the fountains of the great deep. This word, the great deep, to home, is a word for the oceans, for all the oceans of the earth are called the great deep. And, it, and it's again alluding back to Genesis 1, 2, where it says, and... Uh, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Tahom. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we have this connection with the universal language of Genesis 1. Uh, as I've already pointed out several times, these indicate that the the judgment at the flood is a step-by-step -step global uncreation and we'll see how that works tomorrow so only a global flood it can encompass the cosmic reversal or undoing of creation described in Genesis 6 and 7 and tomorrow we're going to see how that un undoing is dealing with days 1 and 2 of creation days 3 and 4 of creation days 5 and 6 of creation and yes even with the Sabbath Sabbath in the flood story? Tune in tomorrow. We'll show you. It's there. The biblical writer could not have used any more forceful expressions, I believe, than these to indicate the global extent of the flood. So I'm proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist who still dares to believe and affirm a literal global flood matching a literal global six-day creation. We can't let this go. I remember Gerhard Hazel. I have a quote from him and then I'll tell the story about him. He said he wrote back in 1975, Dr. Hazel was my doctor fatter. He guided my dissertation and sadly, when he was at the ripe age of 59, just getting started in his career, he was cut short by a tragic car accident. And one of the last, I think the last article he wrote was on the six days of creation, being a literal creation. And he included in that a reference to the flood. Here is his statement on the flood. There is a consistent and overwhelming amount of terminology and formulae 
which on the basis of context and syntax has uniformly indicated that the flood story wants to be understood in a universal sense. The waters destroyed all human and animal plus bird life on the entire landmass of the globe. To read it otherwise means to force a meaning on the carefully written and specific syntactical constructions of the original language which the text itself rejects. Right after Hazel died, Dr. Hazel was a great scholar, not only in Adventist circles, but he was widely respected throughout Australia, I hope. I think he came here a number of times, but also in non-Adventist circles. And so when he died, there was a special celebration of his life at the Evangelical Theological Society. And one of the non-Adventist scholars read the article that he had written on the literal days of creation that had not yet been published. And after he read that article, the entire room stood up and I gave an applause. And after that, I was one of the, uh, had part in that, one of the great non-Adventist scholars, uh, Gleason Archer, came up to me afterwards. And he said, your mentor is dead. But your church cannot let go of this message of a literal solid creation and a literal universal flood. All of our churches, our, non, our, our Christian churches, no longer have that in their statement of beliefs. Don't you guys let it go. And he looked right at me and made me promise that I would do my best that it didn't happen. So I'm here tonight to say that same thing to you. Let's don't let it go. Let's uphold the torch of truth regarding origins. I have one minute left, so I'll read my conclusion. A universal flood is crucial not only in seeking to reconcile science, the geological column in scripture, it is also pivotal in understanding and remaining faithful to the theology of Genesis 1 to 11 and the rest of Scripture. The many links with the universal creation in Genesis 1 and 2, which we have noted in this study, not only support the aspect of universality of the Genesis flood, that's our topic tonight, but serve to theologically connect protology and eschatology in Genesis 1 to 11. I'm glad we've got a paper on this here besides this one. A literal creation week is inextricably linked with a worldwide flood. The acceptance of a literal global flood upholds the causal connection between animal, and, including human death, and the sin of Adam, supporting the clear biblical claim that the wages of sin is death and the need for the atoning, sin-forgiving power of Jesus' death. In other words, the forgiveness of human sin depends, at least in part, upon the historicity and the universality of the flood. In light of the crucial importance of a universal flood for both science and theology, I'm just telling us here what we already know. We need to have a concerted effort among our teachers and our pastors and our lay people and our schools to uphold the universality of the flood in opposition to the unbiblical claims of a non-historical or a local flood. By doing so, we may maintain the inextricable link between creation, catastrophe, and Calvary. Let's make it happen. Amen.